on the road, in the gym, at a coffee house. No matter where you listen, this is Prevention Perk. I'm Steve Miller with MidAmerica PTTC. It's time to perk up our prevention efforts. My guest today is Dave Clausen, who many of our listeners may know as the previous project director here at Region 7 PTTC. As the creator of DJC Solutions, he continues his work in the prevention field, developing people and products that meet the demands of today's workforce. You can also hear Dave on the regular as the host of Prevention Leaders with Dave Clausen. It's always a pleasure to get a chance to speak with the man who lives by the belief that prevention is better together, and together, we are stronger. Hello, Dave Clausen. Welcome to Prevention Perk. Hello. Hey, it's great to be here. I got my coffee ready, and uh, yeah, it's nice to be at the Prevention Perk with you. Everybody's got to have a cup of coffee when they're on the perk. So right. happy you're here. I want to catch up on a lot of stuff. I, I'm sure there are some regular listeners that remember when you sat in my seat, so to speak. But I always like to to uh, to hear from the guest, and uh, you've probably told this story, and some may remember it, but. How in the heck did you get into prevention work? What was your path to prevention like? Oh my goodness. Yes. I I've told the story, but it is a, it is a fun one. Um, well, I say that now that I actually think about it, maybe not because it starts with me getting blown up in Iraq, but, um, so I got deployed to Iraq when I was a junior in college and during the first week in country, uh, I was driving a Humvee and we got blown up by a roadside bomb or IED. Uh, as a result of that, I spent many a year struggling with an undiagnosed traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, and also addiction, alcohol. And as I work towards sobriety, which ooh, living that sober life now, and it is oh so good, I, I felt the, the impacts of addiction personally. Then when I was working as a police officer at Eastern Illinois University, I'm sure all you prevention leaders out there realize that, hey, working as a college cop, it doesn't take long to see the impacts alcohol and other drugs have on students, on a community, and even on how I had to do my job as a police officer. So kind of coupling those two together, those two experiences, I knew that I wanted to get upstream. Before I knew that good old analogy, I was like, let's just, you know, this is a problem. I've felt it. I've experienced it. I've seen it. So we need to do something. So yeah, I went from being a college cop to the assistant director at the Illinois Higher Education Center, shout out IHEC. And we provided prevention training and TA to the colleges in Illinois. And then I kind of bounced from there to the Center for the Application of Prevention Technologies, which was funded by SAMHSA to provide prevention training and TA to SAMHSA grantees. But hey, what do you know? They launched the PTTC and good old chuck d brought me over to mid america and that's uh what brought me to here what well, i like what i like yeah. about your prevention story is it's yeah. similar in the scope as mine we both have mm-hmm. a history where um, substance use was an issue misuse was mm-hmm. an issue. And, and somehow in in our understanding it it just kind of clicks that um going further upstream to try and do what we can to prevent um undo addictions or, or um, suffering or whatever that looks like. So uh, mm-hmm. I, I meet people from time to time that have that same heart for this kind of work. So it's always, uh, it's always good to compare notes with somebody who has uh, the same kind of fondness for prevention and kind of started out in the same place, not even really aware that this was a, I didn't know it was a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't know anything about it. I was working as a college cop and just chatting with the director of the health education resource center and, Next thing you know, he's like, well, Dave, you know, there's like prevention science, right? And like evidence-based prevention strategies. Like, wait, what? Get out of here. There is? Well, let's do more of that. I led a DUI program in Kansas several years ago. And I can remember just one one time sitting down and kind of looking at the recidivism rate. And it was just astounding. And I was like, and I didn't think anything of it. I was just like, is there something besides just they get arrested and they have to come to this class. And then if they don't learn their lesson, they get arrested and they have to come to this class, so to speak mm-hmm. thing about it. So it was a great fit when I started to realize that there's a whole profession around prevention, that there's science, mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. but it's based practices out there. And I just thought that's really pretty cool that um, if you get far, far enough upstream, you can really uh, 
make a difference in people's lives. You're listening to Prevention Perk. The funder of this project, along with all the other products of the MidAmerica PTTC, is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Although funded by SAMHSA, the content of this recording does not necessarily reflect the views of SAMHSA. SAMHSA works with federal and other partners to increase the supply of trained and culturally aware professionals to address the nation's behavioral health needs. Visit samhsa.gov forward slash workforce for more information. This is just two dudes talking at the prevention perk, but I get so passionate when I really think the big picture of how powerful prevention is. We talk about prevention as it relates to just addiction, substance use disorder, but the the ripple effect from from prevention that it can have on all aspects of life, relationships, career, family, wellness, health, like all of it, when you get upstream, like you said, you can really change people's lives. Yeah, it's, and I think it's interesting that, um, you know, you, you, once we get this vantage point, so to speak, that we're not just talking about an individual that's using substances. In a lot of cases, there's comorbidity. There's people mm-hmm. struggling with anxiety or depression. And this is a way that they try to cope with it is by using various substances. And mm-hmm. and when you start to really understand, like you're saying, if you understand the the broad picture of what we're trying to mm-hmm. prevent, it really can have an impact on, on a lot of sectors of the community. Um, yes. And like for my story, it was post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression. And I was drinking as a means to cope, to, to, to medicate with alcohol. And the more I leaned into post-traumatic growth, the, you know, what made me a good soldier and identify, you know, my values and my priorities and who I wanted to be and talked about identity and what are those healthy habits, routines, all around healthy lifestyle. That's what helped me reach and also sustain my sobriety and the positive impacts from all of that aren't just addiction, not just sober. Yeah. Yeah. And as you tell that story, it it reminds me that, well, you were here at the PTTC, what about Mm -hmm. two and a half, almost three years? Yeah, I think almost three years. Yeah. Yeah. And um, then you launched your own, uh, hang out your own shingle, uh, DJC Solutions, uh, doing some uh, coaching and consulting work and stuff. But if, if you, uh, and I'll put the show, in the show notes, your web address, but if people look at your website, everything you've just kind of talked about is mm-hmm. in some way or another is you're using that as a strength now in your life, whether it's veteran services, whether it's your uh, story around uh, substance misuse, whether it's about prevention itself and trying to create a better workforce uh, with prevention mastery and things like that. You really have taken all the pieces and parts and kind of brought it under one hood, if you will, and and uh, are really trying to, to adv- in my, from my vantage point, trying to advance the prevention field. So I thought maybe we could spend a little time and get people caught up because they may know that you were here at one time and they may not, but they could still learn about um, your work. Tell us a little bit about EJC Solution. Yes, indeed. So I like to do a lot of different things. They bring me joy and I see the power of them from podcasting to books, to coaching, to training, to facilitation, to e-learning. And I, I want to do all of those because I know how important and powerful they are. And I'm passionate about them. And so that's kind of why I started my business is I wanted to be free and able to do all of those. And that's what DJC Solutions is. And all of those offerings, those services, those areas are all about helping individuals and organizations, communities reach their next level of excellence. And it comes from my own journey to where that post-traumatic growth, when I looked at my internal strengths and I connected those strengths to aligned experiences, to those habits, sustainable habits and routines, I was able to take my life to the next level. And that's what I bring to organizations are different mechanisms, different means to meet that individual organization where they're at and help them grow to their next level of excellence because y'all are doing amazing work out there, but I want to help you do it even better and better. So do you really feel like you're kind of leaning more into the coaching aspect or are you still kind of across the board a little more balanced with, with other things? I mean, you're doing the podcast, um, Mm -hmm. but uh, what do you really feel like you're drawing on as a strength now? Do you really feel like building up 
people and, and um, organizations is really your, your passion or you still play in the field? <laughs> so all of those different offerings that I have all still serve that same purpose in helping folks reach their next level to, to learn and grow, whether it be coaching or the podcasting, podcasting services, the e-learning, the facilitation. What, what I've grown good at is talking to somebody, having a conversation and really helping uncover their natural strengths that they might not have even known were there. Look at some different blind spots or areas of growth and then help them develop their own plan on how to achieve it, build their own capacity so they can get there. Sometimes that takes online learning. Sometimes it takes coaching. Sometimes it takes bringing a, a facilitation process or method. Sometimes it takes that just that one-on-one -on -one coaching or just a good conversation. I'm doing it all. Yeah. But it all does the same thing, just different ways to do it. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a, that's a, a talking point for uh, mm -hmm. the pension field now is kind of workforce development. And I think this guy's the limit on that because uh, my understanding is, I mean, when I was very young, you know, mm -hmm. pension was completely different than it is now that it leaned kind of on the fence of scare tactics. Mm -hmm. And then there were, mm -hmm. you no, know, I remember some of those really, uh, uh, inexpensively produced brochures that they used to hang out. Um, and, and it wasn't, you know, there wasn't any formula for it. Mm -hmm. And and then it's become a little bit more of a science, let's say in the last 20 years, maybe longer, but, and they, there's been a focus on evidence-based practice and those kind of things. But I really think that workforce development and really kind of like seeing prevention become um, a, a sought after career is really mm -hmm. what I'm excited mm -hmm. about because, you know, I went to career day when I was in high school and I talked to all the people that I thought, Hey, that'd be kind of a fun job to have, so to speak. But there wasn't anybody there that represented behavioral health or substance mm -hmm. use prevention or treatment or anything like that. And I don't know that, that, uh, I don't know if we'll ever reach that point, but I think that that's kind of a neat objective to think that there there could be a time when people go, really, I really want to get into this kind of work. And there's a, there's a track for learning and mm -hmm. there's an ability for people to really kind of jump in and, and bring whatever strengths they have to this prevention force. And that there's, you know, you can go to college and get a degree or whatever that looks like. Cause I think that, uh, that's, that's what at least it sounds like to me is workforce development is, mm -hmm. uh, really uh, crucial right now. I don't know if you Absolutely. hear that or if you experience that, but it seems to me that we've been talking about, at least I've been hearing it mm -hmm. for the last mm -hmm. two or three plus years, but it really um, seems to be something that people are asking themselves. How do we build a workforce to do prevention work? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I've been hearing that across the country, workforce development, workforce, workforce, workforce across the whole behavioral health field. And there's kind of two main thoughts lines of thought or thinking that come to mind as it relates to that one being part of my experience in prevention is that, you know, Hey, we're just paid volunteers. Nobody goes into prevention to, to make money. We don't make much, but we care. That's enough. And I kind of want to push back on that and say, Hey, prevention folks, prevention leaders know your worth. The work you do is oh so important. It's okay to know your worth and ask for your worth. And it's okay to make money and care and do prevention at the same time. We don't need to just accept the fact, oh yeah, they're gonna pay me diddly squat. Yeah, whatever. You are valuable. You are doing important work. Let it be known, it's okay. It's okay. That's a, the first one I get. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to keep it a very um, calm, but I get real fired up about that one. Um, but the other thought is when it comes to workforce development, the conversations that I've been a part of tend to start and really focus on, let's get more people in the front door of prevention, so to speak, get them in the front door, more recruiting, more outreach, all of these different paths or channels to get folks into prevention, which is great. But what about closing the back door? There's a whole other side of workforce development, retention, keeping folks, there's turnover is a problem. What can we do to create a culture in the prevention field that is one of innovation, that is one of belonging, that is one of, of folks feeling valued and 
that's what will also keep folks to stay in the field. And think about like when you've left jobs, a lot of times it's been for new, bigger, better opportunities, more growth potential, or it's become the culture. It was a little toxic and uh, yeah, not so good. You don't need to share those details though. <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting though, and I, I agree with you is, mm -hmm. you know, getting people to understand that this is a, this is a real career you could do mm -hmm. pension. there's mm -hmm. i mean from grassroots in your own community all the way to mm -hmm. washington dc if you want to there's yep. there's a place where people can fit in uh, on the career spectrum if you will but mm -hmm. keeping people around and letting them uh really get a taste of that i for me that's the workforce development because this is this it feels good to do prevention it feels good to um, to mm -hmm. feel like you're making a difference in the communities that you live work serve whatever that looks like but it's uh at the same time prevention is a heavy lift it requires mm -hmm. an individual that um really wants to engage at the community level that really wants to mobilize individuals whether that's at the community level or as as, as a staff mm -hmm. administrator you know, a number of those things, or you can get into your own, uh, your own business venture, like mm -hmm. DGC solutions, mm -hmm. you know, you still have to have that well-rounded kind of experience. And that's what I think is really interesting about prevention work is we're helping to build up community at the same time, we have to learn to kind of build up ourselves. And I think mm -hmm. you will to that, that mm -hmm. you have value and worth and that you can do things um, that you was you know kind of an aspiration to make a difference, but that doesn't mean mm -hmm. that you can't or shouldn't be paid for it. You know, mm -hmm. so there's a lot that could be learned from being involved in prevention. I mm -hmm. I think it's really fascinating how much we're talking about just people and mm -hmm. making a difference in individuals' lives. It's hard to change an entire community, but you can sure influence one and two people at a time, and then they can begin to change a lot of people a little bit further down the line. Absolutely. And um, Dr. Alex Elswick from Kentucky actually interviewed him on the Prevention Leaders podcast, and he's like, you know what's wrong with prevention? We spend too much time talking about the drug and not enough time talking about the individual. Like, yeah, you're a cool dude. Yeah. I want to be friends with you. Well, and that's part of it is, is, um, there's the, there's the substance itself, but the substance is, it's not going to go anywhere. If the person doesn't engage with it, why is the person engaging? Mm -hmm. I want to be cool. I want to fit in, you know, does that fall under mm -hmm. pressure? Is it because I'm trying to mask, you know, insecurities and mm -hmm. get into the mental health realm? So there's a lot that can be looked at, um, mm -hmm. and that's what I think is really uh, cool about uh, prevention work is we're really just building people. You know, I, I heard somebody say, you know, that prevention is better together, and together we are stronger. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is about you and I having a conversation about yep. how mm -hmm. to help other people have a conversation mm -hmm. about how to have other people have a conversation about this thing called prevention, and and it just doesn't seem to end. It's just mm -hmm. community is for me. That's what it comes down to. It's mm -hmm. just building a new community. Have you heard the backstory on that little tagline? No, I have not. I know the guy that came up with it. Would you like to hear the backstory? Sure. Tell us all yeah. about the history of that. So when I first stepped into the, the seat you're now in, um, I had an, inherited the work plan because I wasn't there when they wrote for it or anything. And so I had to spend some time really wrapping my head around, okay, here's the, what I'm supposed to do, the, the, the scope of work, the services, but what is the big picture intent behind the PTTC model, behind what we're doing? And how can I align these services and offerings with that bigger picture why to really create that big impact rather than, okay, here's a webinar, good to go. Met our numbers, Samsa's happy, easy peasy. I was wanted to stretch for something bigger. And so I read Simon Sinek, start with why, but then I also read the culture code by Daniel Coyle. And I kind of paired those two together in that, that those are my playbooks, my go-to books for how I led the first three years before handing the reins over to you is that I wanted to, to have an impact in the culture in our four states in the region. And I, coming from Simon Sinek, the, the why, 
that we came up with was to, to create a culture of community across our four state region so that we can come together and help each other create safe, healthy, drug-free communities. So that was why we did what we did. All of our webinars, all of our training, all of our work was aligned to support that big mission, that why. And from the culture code, if you want to have an impact on the culture, you can, even if you're just an individual because of the, the ripple effect. And there's a story I can tell in a little bit too related to that research. But having a tagline, having a motto, it, it shares that, that common purpose, that vision, and it is to help shape the culture, to create that culture, to support, to foster, to nurture that culture of togetherness to where somebody from Missouri can call somebody in Kansas or Iowa and say, hey, I got a question for you. Can you help me out here? And it, it creates that everybody has a seat at the table when it comes to prevention. doesn't matter who you are. So it was a means to try to help shape and foster and create that culture of togetherness in prevention, because we do need to be coming together to help each other. We can't do it alone. Yeah. There's a lot of time spent um, in silos um, too often. You know, we, we have a job to do and it's kind of the parameters are laid out mm -hmm. for us. And we, we don't understand that to possibly make that a whole lot easier for us or a whole lot more mm -hmm. impactful that we bring in other people to be, uh, in a supporting role. So we collaborate um, mm -hmm. with other people. And I've talked to yeah. some um, people in, in, since I've been doing the podcast that have worked in, in various parts of the, of the nation, but they were from the Midwest and then they were really excited when they could come back to the Midwest. And one individual said, be, I just want to be in the Midwest because we really uh, care about people here. We, and it's mm -hmm. not that people don't care anywhere, but you mm -hmm. really experience a different sense of community in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, together it, it is so much better. No one person has all the answers. Think about coalition leaders. Y'all can't do the work. Sometimes it all falls in your shoulders, but you shouldn't be doing it all. You can't do it all. We need each other. We do. It's how we're wired. I, I've taught the uh, mental health first aid training for a number of years. And one of the things I, I talk about in there is the work that we do in prevention, the work that's happening through like mental health first aid, the work that happens mm -hmm. with the Alliance of Drug Endangered Children, all of that has a common thread. Now it is preventing mm -hmm. something, but what's underneath all of that is kind of like this institutional community. It's like, mm -hmm. we're trying to teach people how to, how to have community and mm -hmm. it seems like it should be a little bit more intuitive, mm -hmm. but it really is a very um, challenging thing to learn to do, to build community mm -hmm. with other people, to, um, to engage with them at whatever level that we find ourselves in. And, mm -hmm. uh, but that's what, at least the way I see it, that's the, what all of these trainings are trying to do is get us to acknowledge mm -hmm. our neighbor and engage with our neighbor in a way that, mm -hmm improves the community that we live in. I would go one step bigger than just build community. And I'm guilty of it, but I feel like we set ourselves up for not as well for success when we say evidence-based strategies for prevention. And I'm trying to change my language and they're evidence-based interventions, evidence-based programs. Sometimes we use those interchangeably, but in essence, the, the interventions, the programs are tactics. The training, the workshop, the this is how you build community are tactics. Right. And the bigger picture strategy is culture. It's that environmental change. Those are different ways we want to help shape and change the culture of our community to one that supports health, that, that fosters healthy, responsible decisions around substances and helps change that. And... Yeah. So that's kind of where my mind went with giving folks the how to, because when you build that community, that sense of community, that conversation, the connectedness, the, the belonging, that's going to change the culture as a whole too. And I think it changes the, it influences the culture certainly. And I think mm -hmm. if we're really uh, like you're saying, if we're using some of the tools that are out there to help build community, it, it uh, influences culture, but it also it takes into consideration that culture is unique and it mm -hmm. enhances that flavor. So it, mm -hmm. where, where you come from with your culture may be different from where I come from and they can coexist together 
And as a result of that, we now have a much richer experience in life. Mm -hmm. What's Absolutely. interesting is, you know, I would have not had any frame of reference for a conversation like this when I started mm -hmm. intervention, but as mm -hmm. the days have gone by, I realized that that's really what's at the heart of this is making that um, cultural change or that community mm -hmm. change where people are more engaged, more present, more interactive, and more tolerant of mm -hmm. neighbors, their friends, their coworkers. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we prevent something, then, hey, you know, Even I think better. it's almost automatic. If I'm more engaged with you and you're more engaged with me and we're spending our time in facilitating that relationship, so to speak, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're, we're less apt to get caught up in behavioral health decline or into substance mm -hmm. abuse, those kinds of things, um, keeping preoccupied with making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And speaking of culture, too, um, one of our friends that is also a, a rock star in the field, Nicole Augustine, had once. The other uh, day. Yeah, uh, I love working with her. Um, she's doing so much good for the field. But she had said, you know, culture is constantly changing. It is always changing. And so if you aren't, you know, aware of it, if you aren't intentional in trying to help foster and nurture, you're going to be left behind. It's just going to, it's changing regardless of what we do. So why not try to foster positive change as it relates to culture? Well, and culture has changed. I can certainly see that across my lifespan, but at the same time, I alluded to this earlier, so has prevention. But I think that the reason prevention has adapted and evolved is because it understands that community mm -hmm. has adapted and, and evolved and, mm -hmm. and uh, things are changing. Some mm -hmm. days it seems like things are changing so fast and other days mm -hmm. it seems like uh, not enough, but um, mm -hmm. Oh, that's a whole nother rant or ramble that I can go down and that I feel like in prevention, we, we aren't set up to really be able to innovate. Our data is often on a delayed slow cycle for, for something to become evidence-based that takes so long. Our grant funding can be rather restrictive. So how are we as prevention leaders supposed to, supposed to innovate? just not just stay up to date with current trends, but oh my goodness, get out in front of them, get upstream. And that's kind of one of the things that I try to do in DJC Solutions is like, y'all as a, a prevention leader, you might not have the, the time to, to go learn what's new, to learn the new innovations and then figure out how to bring them into the work you do. So I try to do that for them. I, I bring the innovations to them. Well, when you're talking about that, I know I'm mm -hmm. very little about this. You've explained it to me some, and you've done a little project mm -hmm. for us here at uh, Mid America. But mm -hmm. uh, Carlton Hall and Carlton was a guest on the podcast mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. back talking about prevention mastery, which is really uh, kind of mirroring or marrying, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, the prevention science and technology and community all on like a digital platform. Can you kind mm -hmm. of? Flesh that out a little bit, like what is yes. LMS and what is a prevention mastery? So I have been known, and uh, y'all listening, you don't feel like you need to raise your hands, but I know me and others tend to register for like a webinar with the full intention of, oh, I'll watch the recording. Or when we're training a new employee or onboarding, we might say, hey, go watch this recorded webinar the PTTC did last summer. You're good to go. Like, that's not training. It's so passive. When you look at adult learning principles and theory, like one, I don't know that I've ever gone back and rewatched a recorded webinar. If I have, I guarantee I was multitasking. So it's really not effective training. And Carlton and I teamed up to, to take prevention online training to the next level. And so that's what we do. We, one will build a whole system to where somebody, an organization from a coalition to state to nonprofit could say, hey, we want to offer high quality, effective, engaging online training to our, our folks. But we have no idea what an LMS is or what a SCORM is or how to even do it. We got you covered. It, it's just like you're saying, it's good. You give us a vision, the idea, we'll build you your own customized learning management system, meaning your folks can go to a website, log in, and take all the training that they need. Certificates are even automated. It's all like one-stop shopping. We've also got a smartphone app, so they can take learning with them on the go. 
And our courses are built very interactively. So they have to physically interact with the content, which will help reinforce learning. The more they engage with the content, the more they're going to learn. And they're also mobile ready. So they look great on phones. So y'all can go train whenever, wherever. So it's bringing training in a better, more effective manner to individuals where they're at. And I, I think um, if I'm understanding you correctly, the sky's mm -hmm. the limit on that. You can design around any particular topic. It's not, I mean, mm -hmm. it, could be, it could be about a specific substance. It could be about substances. Mm -hmm. It could be about mm -hmm. SPIF model. It could be about, you know, how to mobilize or engage at the community level. All of that could be taken mm -hmm. into consideration and build something that, that uh, the end user feels like um, really meets their needs, whether it's in their community or in their own shop, so to speak. Yeah, so we've actually built training just about an actual department within an organization. Uh, this is who these folks are and this is what they do, aka this is how you can also work with them because they're here to support you, not just about, hey, this is current drug trends or this is the strategic prevention framework. There's a lot you can do with it, a lot. You're listening to Prevention Perk. A focus on health equity allows communities to direct their prevention strategies towards the most vulnerable populations in the region they serve. You can learn to embed an equity lens into your everyday prevention efforts by viewing the series Structural Inequities Affecting Prevention Practice, a product created in partnership with RISE Consultants and hosted on the MidAmerica PTTC YouTube channel. A link is available in the show notes. Well, Dave, it's always a lot of fun to have yeah. an opportunity to chat with you. I uh, mm -hmm. always like to let the sage be on the stage, so to speak. So is there something we haven't talked about that you'd like to flesh out for a moment? Or is there um, something you'd like to challenge the audience to think, say, or do um, mm -hmm. as their next uh, their next step in the prevention realm? Ooh, so you've already shared the, the world-class tagline. <laughs> Prevention's better together, so I won't go that route. That's normally my go-to. Um, so I'd like to share actually a lesson I learned on my Iraq deployment and how I use it in prevention and how all of our wonderful listeners can use it as well. We called it the GOT method, meaning the get out of the truck method. When we were in Iraq, we were tasked with different sectors. And we had to essentially patrol that sector, build relationships, look for hidden weapons, all that stuff. And what was most effective was when we got out of our Humvees, we walked the streets and built relations. We just talked to the community members. And once they built enough trust and understanding that, hey, we were there to help them, they began to help us help them. And I did that same approach when I was a police officer. I loved foot patrol. I got out and I just walked laps around campus just talking to folks. The power of getting out of your office, going out and meeting people where they are and just having a conversation. It might sound daunting, might sound overwhelming, it might sound a little weird and silly and off the wall, but it is very powerful and it's actually so enjoyable getting paid to talk to people, getting paid to make connections and learn about what they're up to, their struggles, their challenges, their mission, their vision. And through that, you'll see how you can collaborate, how you can support them. Because the more you help them, the more they're going to help you. Sounds like you were practicing to have a podcast when you were walking around on the college campus and didn't even know it. Or when you were on the streets of Iraq, you were out <laughs> interviewing people and, uh, and asking them how they could, uh, you know, make the world that we live in a little better place. Absolutely. And actually as a field training officer at the police department, actually it might have been before we hit record we we're talking about soft skills and i found myself having to actually teach or show the the new recruits the younger officers hey this is how you just walk up to students and say hi and start a conversation like that that soft skill we might be drifting away from that a little bit so be intentional if if you got it teach others share it take them under your wing it's okay to go out and just talk to folks all you gotta do is say hi out of the truck the yep. got get got get out of the truck go say hi don't you be shy learn, you can learn more about dave at djc solutions i'll put his web link in the show notes he also has um, a podcast mm -hmm. that you can listen in on prevention leaders with dave clausen mm -hmm. you also have a oh. network that you've put together yes. your uh, 
trying to nice. uh, bring together different voices and mm -hmm. so you about that on your website. So appreciate yes. you being here. It has always been a pleasure to have an interaction with Dave. You're, you're a, a, a man that I aspire to be like when I grow up. So. Hey, you just focus on being Steve. Don't be me. I'm just Dave. But uh, always fun. Anytime you want to grab a coffee at the Prevention Perk, let me know. And listeners, just know that I'm only one email away. So please don't ever hesitate to reach out because I'm always happy to help. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. And thank you for listening to Prevention Perk, a podcast from MidAmerica PTTC. To learn more about our innovations, visit pttcnetwork.org and look under your PTTC for the MidAmerica link. Remember, prevention is better together, and together we are stronger.